Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show in iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. We're also on Instagram at vmspod, so check that one out for some fun pictures. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Now it's time for the fourth annual guest list episode. Um, you guys who have been around for the past three years know that this is the one where I ask the past year's Virtual Memories guests to tell us about the favorite book they read in the past year. It doesn't have to be something published in 2016, just something they read and loved during the year. Some of them also told me about the books or authors they're hoping to read in 2017. We got responses from more than 30 guests, as well as one bonus contributor, and I'll explain that situation when we get to him. I don't give too much of an intro to anybody in this one, so I really hope you'll look up this episode and the great roster we have in our archives or on iTunes. But if you visit either chimeraobscura.com slash VM or vmspod.com, you'll find a link to The Guest List 2016. And that has links to all the books mentioned in this episode, as well as links to each guest's show, so you can find out more about them. And if you're interested... My favorite reads from the past year and my 2017 goals will come up at the end of the episode. Okay, now let's get started. Our first guest is Carol Tyler, who is the author of the amazing comic Soldier's Heart. Carol writes, for 2016, it was The Leopard by Giuseppe de Lampedusa. I couldn't read it before going to Italy, so I saved it till I came home. Canta al mio cuore. At least that's how I think it's pronounced. In 2017, Carol writes, I want to read The Rivers Ran Backward by Christopher Phillips. It's about the complexities of politics and border states on the Mason-Dixon line in, in, uh, during the Civil War. And it explains so much about where we are all these years later. Our next guest is David Leopold, author of The Hirschfeld Century. David writes, Although I've enjoyed many books this year, hands down, the one that's my favorite is one I'm just finishing, Four of the Three Musketeers, The Marx Brothers on Stage, by Robert Bader from Northwestern University Press. It is hard to believe this story has never been told except in anecdotes by the various brothers. Most of what has appeared in books over the years, including those of the brothers themselves, has been wrong, and Bader has sniffed out all the facts. Better still, he does it in a lively way that not only tells the readers the team's story, including the actual stories of how they got their names, their personae, and many of the bits you see in their films, but also provides context of the vaudeville world. I know the author, and I'm thanked in the acknowledgments, but as one who has friends who write plenty of books every year, this one stands out. It is a great story, well told. For 2017, David writes, I'm about ready to make a deep dive into the history of Disney animation books for a project. There are a number of titles, which I could list, but they're pretty numerous. It is more than just when Mickey Mouse enters the picture, but how the style of drawing, and indeed how caricature, enters the picture to make the characters truly come to life. I also hope to read Neurotribes by Steve Silberman, which rewrites, and in this case corrects, the history of autism. I've dipped my toe in it, and it's remarkable. My wife has also read it. She's a speech-language pathologist and knows the population well, and she heartily endorses it. Up next is Harry Katz, who David introduced me to. I'm sort of semi-organizing these guys. Um, it's not alphabetical. It's not chronological from when their shows aired or anything like that. I just thought there were some groups that made sense. Anyway, Harry Katz writes, Edward Sorrell's Mary Astor's Purple Diary, The Great American Sex Scandal of 1936, from Live Right Publishing Company. 
When Tina Brown took over at The New Yorker in 1992, she turned to veteran illustrator Ed Sorrell to launch her bold new look. His cover depicting a peacocked punk enjoying a brilliantly foliated carriage ride through Central Park ushered in a provocative new age for the stay-at-old journal. Eustace Tilly, the lily-livered high-society cover boy from the magazine's inaugural 1925 issue, dropped his monocle, aghast at this brash assault on the time-honored intellectual gentility. Supremely talented and wickedly funny, Sorrell has created more than 40 New Yorker covers and is widely recognized as one of the most influential comic artists of the past 50 years. He's also a terrific writer, and his latest book is sensational, an exquisitely illustrated, well-researched look back at a 1936 sex scandal and courtroom drama involving one of Hollywood's leading ladies and several leading men. Movie stars were center stage during the Depression, before television, big-time sports, and presidential politics took over market share. Their off-screen exploits made news around the globe and often shaped the course of their careers. Mary Astor, who starred in the Maltese Falcon, among other popular hits, survived her scandal and went on to further fame before her sad denouement as an elderly inmate in an industry rest home. Sorrell's passion for the lady and Hollywood's faded glory shines through his words and pictures. The book humanizes her perils, revealing with wit and warmth the forgotten morality tale and the unhappy truths underlying the lives of those we admire from afar. Beautifully printed and visually spectacular, the book's elegant end papers frame the colorful narrative. They lushly portray the famously demure actress, born Lucille Langhank in Quincy, Illinois, as a modern Ariadne, a naked goddess splayed out in luxurious fantasy, the stuff dreams and Hollywood are made of. Sit back, relax, pour a glass of TCM curated wine, and enjoy the show. Our next guest is Ben Modell, the silent movie accompanist who David Leopold also turned me on to. Ben writes, I don't have a favorite, but only because I've only read one book, and I haven't finished it. That book is The First King of Hollywood, The Life of Douglas Fairbanks by Tracy Gossel. For 2017, put me down for Slapstick Divas by Steve Massa and After the Silence by Michael Slowick. Our next guest is Jim Woodring, who writes... I have obviously reached the point in my life where I find the effort of presenting myself in the best light too troublesome, because I tell you frankly that Looking for Betty MacDonald by Paula Becker was the book I most eagerly anticipated and thoroughly enjoyed in 2016. The reasons are more occult than literary. Betty MacDonald has had an undue, almost mystical influence on my life. I read her book, The Egg and I, unrecommendable today, when I was 12, and her dark and bloody descriptions of the Olympics Peninsula and the savages of all nations who live there drew me irresistibly to that part of the world. The Egg and I was my first encounter with transgressive literature. Her vicious description of an Indian picnic on the beach is deeply shocking on multiple levels. It is a dark book that hints broadly at a deeper darkness behind the scenes. Looking for Betty MacDonald isn't expertly written, but it tells a story of this angry, interesting woman's life and reveals what lay behind many of her perceptively coded descriptions of people and places. I paid a heavy price for this information, for knowledge does indeed extinguish the flame of curiosity. Up next is Leslie Stein, whose most recent book is Time Clock from Fantagraphics. For 2016, Leslie loved A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin. This is a collection of short stories that Berlin wrote over her lifetime, many seemingly autobiographical. Some of them are only about five pages long, but are emotionally devastating as well as funny. People compare her to Raymond Carver quite often, so if you like that sort of thing, you should give this a shot. And as far as comics are concerned, Noah Van Skyver's Blamo No. 9 was so great. For 2017, I'd like to read more Jean Rhys. I've only read Leaving Mr. Mackenzie, which was excellent. Next is Andrea Sarumi, whose new book is Why Would You Do That? from Hick Hock Press. At the top of my list is Libby's Dad by Eleanor Davis, published by Retrofit this year. It's a short, beautifully drawn, poignant comic about a group of young girls at a sleepover. The dad in the title is the subject of a mystery to these girls, as they idly wonder whether or not he's a violent man. He's just one of many mysteries of adulthood that these girls speculate about while they play in the pool. It's a short comic, but it punches straight down to that in-between feeling of being young and knowing something about the world, but still not understanding it. Reading this evoked uncanny consciousness of seeing the events of this story simultaneously as a young girl would and as an adult would 
aware of the gulf of experience and change that lies between those two points. It's also gorgeously drawn in a glowing palette of colored pencil with unusual panel and page layouts that masterfully move the eye from moment to moment. Actually, one of the books I'm eagerly anticipating in 2017 is Eleanor Davis's You Plus a Bike Plus a Road from Koyama Press, the spare and evocative diary that Davis kept as she biked across the country. Another book I loved reading this year was Spectacles by British comedian and co-host of The Great British Bake Off and Supersizers Go, Sue Perkins. Those familiar with her TV work will find it impossible not to hear her voice on every page, which isn't a bad thing. Like the author, this memoir is clever and humane. She fully delves into the absurdity of her family, her experiences, and her own behavior, but also never loses her sympathy for the humanity that makes everyone act so bonkers. I especially loved her account of being booked for a comedy gig that went on after a domestic violence support group, and of belatedly discovering she wasn't on a program called The World's Most Interesting Roads, but on The World's Most Dangerous Roads, as she careened sideways down a frozen Alaskan highway. In 2017, she writes, I'm looking forward to reading Poppies of Iraq from Drawn and Quarterly by Brigitte Findakli, drawn by Louis Trondheim, which follows her experiences growing up in Iraq and eventually fleeing it. Up next is Bob Eckstein, whose recent book, Footnotes, is one of my faves, which we'll get to at the end of the show. Bob writes, For 2016, based on a true story by Norm MacDonald. On the cover, it says it's a memoir. It should say, loosely based on a true story. Once I got past the fact that it blurs into fiction, I found myself loving this book and the writing. So much so, I've listened to it twice. I made an exception here to get the audio, because it's Norm doing the reading, and his delivery is, at times, very funny. For 2017, The Speed of Sound, Thomas Dolby's memoir, is on the top of a pile of books that surround my bed like a fortress, but I do hope to tackle that one next year. David Mickick's new book is Bellows People, and he writes, In 2017, I'll be writing the volume on Stanley Kubrick for the Yale Jewish Live series. I hope it comes out in 2018 for the 50th anniversary of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Best book I read this past year? Is it okay that I'm still reading it? It's Steve Englund's biography of Napoleon, which is everything you could want in a biography of Napoleon. What a subject to rise to, and boy, does he rise. Tied for first is David Grossman's new book, which I did finish, and in Hebrew no less. It'll come out in English soon. It's called Sus Nichnas Le Bar. Horse walks into a bar. It's about a stand-up comic, and the book is mostly a report of a single stand-up routine. It's more than just a tour de force. It's devastating, penetrating, and, of course, hilarious. Don't miss it. Rachel Hadas's new books are the poetry collection The Question in the Vestibule and the essay collection Talking to the Dead. She writes, The two books that made the biggest impression on me in 2016 both of which I read this past summer, were Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and David Haskell's The Forest Unseen. Both are nonfiction, both cleanly written, though Harari analyzes with authority and Haskell comes up close to his chosen patch of forest and observes closely and expatiates. Both books are dark reading, especially the former. Harari sets the scene for Trump quite efficiently, making it abundantly clear just how restless, aggressive, quarrelsome, and destructive we sapiens have been from the start. Haskell writes with tender lyricism, but also deep knowledge about the biosphere, specifically a mandala of land in Tennessee's Cumberland Plateau, where he regularly returns and observes. From their respective macro and micro viewpoints, both books are poignant and refreshingly clear. No conversations. The tragedies to which they bear witness aren't on the scandal of an individual life, generation, or neighborhood. Something bigger is going on. I think of the beginning of Walt Whitman's poem, This Compost. Something startles me where I thought I was safest. And yet, were we ever safe? Next is Willard Spiegelman, whose new essay collection is Senior Moments. Willard introduced me to Rachel and to David Mickix, which is why these three are together. Willard just writes, My fave is Bob Gottlieb's Avid Reader, A Life. Also, collected poems of Adrienne Rich. Cartoonist and archaeological artist Glennis Fox writes, For prose, the books that stand out for me are the Elena Ferrante novels. I don't mean to join Ferrante fever for its sheer popularity. Her writing and the world she writes about are fascinating. I listened to the novels as audio books, 19 hours each, while I was working on my comic called Ale Ego last winter. 
My comic is about my first trip to Greece and a friendship I formed there while away from a dangerous boyfriend I left in Boston. The novels resonated in their depth of description of a friendship while lovers come and go. Another author I read last year is Lucy Derbiano. Her comics are published in France and not yet available in English. The books of hers I've read are Low, a version of Daphne and Chloe with a lovelorn nymph as a main character, Mellow Pop, about a rock band on a cruise ship, Tresor, and Orage et d'Espoir. I love these books for their quick and humorous dialogue and twists of plot, and appealing characters and excessive drawing. These books appear to be drawn quickly and are not labored, but the storylines fit so intricately together that the craft behind them is something I wish I had. Up next is Jim Ottaviani, the writer of the comic The Imitation Game, a graphic biography of Alan Turing. Jim writes, My two favorites this year are both apocalyptic, which is, I'm sure, a coincidence, albeit not a happy one. Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven has stuck with me like few others in recent memory. I read this in March and still view the world through its lens. I probably will for a long time to come. Kazuo Ishiguro's The Buried Giant treads right on the border of fantasy and allegory, and probably a bunch of other genres I wasn't smart enough to identify. It's more haunted, but less haunting, for me, than Mandel's book. It's subtle and powerful, and even though it's a slow-moving story, it had me on the edge of my seat at the end. For 2017, Alan Moore's Jerusalem has created its own gravity well on my dining room table since May, and I hope to summon the energy to at least crack it open this coming year. I'm not confident I'll finish it, given the struggle I remember from his first novel, but I think this one is written mostly in English as humans speak it in the 20th century, so how tough can it be? Next is Haley Campbell. Haley writes, For 2016, Sabbath Theater by Philip Roth, which I read in January and hasn't been beaten, except by American Pastoral, which came close in August. In the great canon of books about old perverts fucking and dying, this is my favorite. Also loved... Undisputed Truth by Mike Tyson and a ghostwriter who deserves a thousand prizes, and Norman Mailer's The Fight, despite his hilarious ego. For 2017, probably Thomas Pynchon, because I've only read Inherent Vice and I got bored halfway through, so I feel like an idiot and I owe him more than that. I would also read Alan Moore's Jerusalem if they hadn't printed the text so small. You have no idea how much this infuriates me. Next is Nina Bunjevac, who writes... My favorite book this year was Antonio Moresco's Distant Light, published by Archipelago. As far as next year, I look forward to Mimi Pond's new installment of Over Easy, The Customer is Always Wrong. Arthur Lubau, author of Deanne Arbus, Portrait of a Photographer, another one of my faves, writes, Stoner by John Williams. It brings to a small and inconspicuous life the emotional force of a romantic symphony, in prose that is, a, that is as modestly and delicately beautiful as a life it describes. It was written 50 years ago, but the cult keeps growing, and it caught up with me. I've never read Lolita, I confess. I keep meaning to. I know it would be pure enjoyment. So what's keeping me? 2017, I will. Christopher Nelson, the outgoing president of St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, writes, The new translation of Italio Calvino's Collection of Sand. Some 33 years ago, I was introduced to his latest book through the New York Times Book Review, Mr. Palomar. Since that publication, I've read everything of his in English translation, convinced that he was one of the three or four finest writers of the 20th century. Over the Thanksgiving holiday, I discovered yet a new translation of essays, Collection of Sand. It is a fine closing in upon Mr. Palomar. His work casts across the widest range. It encompasses stories of the deepest imagination. He never wrote a bad book. This latest collection does a good job of reminding us of his capacity for observation, as Mr. Palomar did. I feel as though I have come full circle with this author in his latest collection. Can you imagine, for example, what it would mean to collect sand from various places around the world? Quote, Perhaps by staring at the sand as sand, words as words, we can come close to understanding how and to what extent the world that has been ground down and eroded can still find in sand a foundation and model. It's a beautiful collection of words and exercises of the imagination. In our podcast last June, President Nelson also mentioned that he was planning on returning to Middlemarch, which is a, a regular for him, and also tackling Marilyn Robinson's new essay collection. So we'll put those in his 2017 roster, too. David Carr, author of Holy Resilience, writes, Favorite book of this year is already well-known, but would be Kazuo Ishiguro's Buried Giant. 
Its reflections on memory, aging, and relationships both fit into the current political moment for me and my own experiences these last years with my mother, my dad's quote-unquote princess, to echo an expression in the book. Books to tackle this coming year? I'm immersing myself in all things French as preparation for a month-long sojourn in Paris this May as a visiting professor at the College de France. As part of that, I'm planning to listen to Proust's Swan's Way, in English, because my French is not yet good enough, sadly. Elizabeth Hand, author of the new Cass Neary novel, Hard Light, writes, Louise Erdrich, The Roundhouse. I finally had the chance to read this novel by one of my favorite writers. It's a dark and devastating evocation of loss and grief, and also of adolescence. Erdrich has almost an, has an almost supernatural ability to draw a reader into her world. Stunning. Al Ridenour's Krampus and the Old Dark Christmas. I love Christmas books, and also books of folklore. Ridenour's study of the northern European figure of the Krampus, as well as other dark spirits, is both masterful and a huge amount of fun. And the photos are gorgeous. Another beautifully produced book from Feral House. This would make a great gift for your heavily tattooed and pierced favorite aunt, niece, or brother. Simon Reynolds, Shock and Awe, Glam Rock and Its Legacy, from the 70s to the 21st century. We'll be processing David Bowie's death for a long time. And this book by renowned rock critic Reynolds does a great job of examining Bowie within the context of glam, the short-lived, five years max, phenomenon that helped give birth to punk, electronica, and disco in the late 70s. It's also a great spur to spending hours on YouTube googling forgotten bands. Some of my shock and awe came from remembering how we dressed back then. Tom Tomorrow, also known as Dan Perkins, who uh, recently put out 25 Years of Tomorrow, a giant collection of his This Modern World strips, writes, I've been reading a lot about Russia since my wife and I visited there at the beginning of the summer. She was a speaker at an academic conference. All the Kremlin's Men is a book that might provide some insight into Donald Trump's approach to the truth, particularly the sections focus, focusing on Kremlin propagandist Vladislav Surkov. Arkady Ostrov's The Invention of Russia looks at the years from Gorbachev to Putin and how the latter systematically suppressed the country's nascent free press. For a general sense of the pervasiveness of corruption in daily Russian life, I'd recommend Peter Pomeratsov's Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. For anyone who shares my fascination with the early days of the Russian space program, I'd recommend the Yuri Gagarin biography Starman by Jamie Duran and Piers B Bizony, as well as the heartbreaking graphic novel Laika by Nick Abadsis. As for fiction, I really enjoyed Charlie Jane Anders' All the Birds in the Sky. I'd also recommend the Sandman Slim series by my friend Richard Kadri, though you definitely want to start with the first one and work your way through. Oh, and speaking of Russia, I've been a huge fan of Martin Cruz Smith's Arkady Renko novel since Gorky Park first came out in the early 80s. Somehow I missed the latest one, Tatiana, when it was published a few years ago, so I ended up reading it a few weeks before I spent a lovely early summer's day in the real Gorky Park, people watching and strolling through the nearby graveyard of toppled Soviet statuary. For 2017, I guess the interest in Russian history and politics continues. I've got a stack of books to work through, including Masha Gessen's Putin biography, The Man Without a Face, and an old biography of Sergei Korolov, the scientist who barely survived one of Stalin's purges in the 30s and spent several years in a labor camp before eventually being released to head the Soviet space program. And at some point, I'll probably try to work my way through the Romanovs. New Yorker cartoonist Liza Donnelly writes, Favorite book I read in 2016? Three Stages of Amazement by Carol Edgarian. Book or author I hope to tackle in 2017? Sheesh, I don't know. I don't really tackle authors as much as what strikes me at a given moment that I want to read. And it's always something relatively current, even though I know I have huge gaps in my literature reading creds. Right now, I want to finish a book on India that I'm enjoying called In Spite of the Gods, The Rise of Modern India by Edward Luce. Another New Yorker cartoonist? And the husband of Liza Donnelly, Michael Maslin, writes, Favorite book? John Wayne, The Life and Legend, by Scott Amon. That's E-Y-M-A-N. This is a continuation of my zigzaggy interest in reading biographies of iconic figures. Walt Disney, Chaplin, Mao, Groucho, Johnny Carson, etc. Book to tackle in 2017. Probably one of the five Saul Bellow books I acquired this year. Two biographies, a collection of letters, and two volumes of collected works. I read parts of each, never settling in with one. That's 
probably the bad reading habits instilled or installed in high school. They die hard. Another New Yorker cartoonist, Ed Corin, writes, I've been dabbling in my reading. Here's a list of what I've been working on simultaneously. The Arab of the Future by Riyad Satouf. Midnight in Europe by Alan First. Great travel reading. Dusk and Other Stories by James Salter. Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. On the Horizon for 2017, Sweet Francaise by Irene Nemirovsky. Artist Glenn Baxter, whose new book is Almost Completely Baxter, writes, Favorite book would be Luc Sante's The Other Paris. I also enjoyed Cronopios and Famas by Julio Cortazar. I hope to read Alastair Brochi's biography of Alfred Jarry in 2017. Anne Patty, author of Living with a Dead Language, writes, The best books I read this year, Don Quixote by Cervantes, On Trying to Sit Still by Jenny Diskey. Next year, I'm focusing on George Eliot, beginning with Middlemarch. The artist and cartoonist M.K. Brown writes, As I probably mentioned when we talked last summer, I'm a very eclectic reader. Even so, here's my short list of books enjoyed in 2016 and anticipated in the coming year. First, while waiting for new books, I must always have a book going at all times. My defaults are rereading anything by Michael Connolly or David Sedaris. I can always count on them. Three books I enjoyed in 2016 were The Light Between Oceans by M. L. Stedman, All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, and Hyperspace by Michio Kaku. I plan to reread Lauren Starrell's Alexandria Quartet and see if it is still there. Beyond that, friends and book clubs have provided new titles I'm looking forward to. I'll be very interested in the books your other guests will provide. Virginia Heffernan, author of Magic and Loss, writes, 2016, Ian McEwan, Nutshell. If it's an Ian McEwan year, his is always my favorite book. He never fails me. My advice, get a favorite writer who's alive and prolific, and you have many great reading years. For 2017, Reckoning at Eagle Creek by Jeff Biggers and Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Also, Norman O. Brown, Life Against Death. Cartoonist Glenn Head, whose new book from Fantagraphics is called Chicago, writes, Favorite book from this past year? Orwell by Gordon Bowker. It came out a while ago, 2003, but I'm just digging into it now. It's a really solid, well-researched book about one of my favorite authors. I'm really enjoying it. I think of Orwell's prose being for a writer what Chester Gould's art is to a cartoonist. Pure clarity. The great translator Burton Pike writes, The best book I read this year was Melville's Moby Dick, last encountered eons ago. This time I was overwhelmed by the extraordinary technical skill with which Melville constructed the story step by step, in spite of its apparent chaos. It's like a Greek tragedy, Oedipus Rex. I now regard it, hands down, as the greatest American novel. Translator Ross Benjamin writes, 2016, Histopia by David Means, and that's H-Y-S-T-O-P-I-A. For 2017, he hopes to uh, tackle some Ivy Compton Burnett. Now it's time for the bonus guest. Um, the bonus guest is Frank Source. You guys don't know who he is. In the episode I did with Mike Cole in December, it's actually the, the previous one, I mentioned that a work-related pal saw this passage about me and this podcast in The Hustle Book, a business book that came out this fall. Uh, Frank is that pal. He's a vice president at UPM Pharmaceuticals, and while it is rare that I bring my business and my podcast together, I decided to because he managed to find some just out of the blue weird citation about me in a business book, he should get a spot in the guest list. So I asked him for his favorite read. And here it is. The best book I read in 2016 was by far Shoe Dog, a memoir by Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. Like many of us, I was extremely familiar with Nike products and attire and have used and wore, worn them over the past 30 years. However, I was completely unfamiliar with the story behind the brand and the company. Phil Knight took me on a fascinating journey from his immediate postgraduate years up until the present time, and all the trials, travails, and tribulations in between. It never occurred to me, or I never read or heard, that Nike struggled for so many years to make money and fight their colossal competitors of the time, and then fight the government, and struggle to keep their own distribution areas that they so adroitly built. The book was a great lesson on how difficult and stressful it is to build and run a new business, and the guts, ingenuity, teamwork, and creativity it takes to keep it afloat, and eventually turn it into a massive success. Phil Knight's life is amazing. 
His manner of writing was such that I almost felt like I made a friend in reading the pages. I laughed, I cried, and ultimately I walked away with a tremendous amount of admiration for the man, and for his company, and most importantly, his values. Get a copy. You won't regret it. Our next guest is the only one that's actually recorded instead of read, and that is Mike Cole. Yeah. So my favorite book in 2016 was James Rom, R-O-M-M's Ghost on the Throne. Um, Rom writes about the, um, the Diodoci, uh, the successors of Alexander the Great. These are Alexander the Great's generals, um, Eumenes, um, Lysimachus, Seleucus, Antigonus, um, that fought over the fragments of Alexander the Great's empire after his death. Um, and he is, again, one of the great narrative historians and Many people don't know this, but the Wars of the Successors, it's just like Game of Thrones. It's this incredible period of intrigue and marriage alliances and wars and backstabbing, and except that it was all real. And um, No dragons. No dragons, uh, almost. They had war elephants, which I guess is close. And Rom evokes this with a fiction writer's touch uh, that will have you on the edge of your seat. And to know that it was all real um, is... It makes it absolutely sublime. In 2017, um, my real goal is – I'm sorry to keep harping on uh, history. That's really uh, my goal. Yeah, I find that incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, my real goal is I would like to track um, the crusading orders. Um, and by this, I mean the Knights Hospitalier, the Knights Templar, and the Teutonic Knights. Um, from their earliest origins – uh, into their current existence, and many of them do currently still exist as charitable organizations, such as the Knights of Malta. So to do this, it's not one work, but probably at least a dozen that I'm going to have to read um, to have a, a really full and rich under, understanding of these orders and how they moved. I want to see, I'm particularly interested in seeing how an organization of crusading knights, warrior monks essentially, that are really not different at all from Al-Qaeda, um, as religious fanatics devoted to increasing the misery of others. I mean, the Knights of Malta were, were murderers, they were jihadis, they were pirates for many, many years of the worst sort. And they are today a charitable organization devoted to making the world better. They are the real extrapolation of their own ideology that they believed but did not practice in the medieval world and in the Renaissance. And um, I think that that's an incredible story arc, and I don't think it's one that anyone tells fully. So I'm looking forward to piecing it together for myself. That's a really cool historical puzzle that I'm I'm wanting to tackle. You should also check out Masters of Atlantis by Charles Portis, the oh. novel by the guy who did a uh, True Grit. I don't know if you've ever very cool. I'll add it okay, it to my yeah. list. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll True send you Grit's an, an amazing that, book, so. and the and the yeah. remake with uh, Jeff Bridges was it? Yeah, uh, is one of the best movies I've ever seen. It's completely atypical of the rest of Portis's novels. Um, Masters of Atlantis. Uh, Masters of Atlantis is the weirdest of of his books, but yeah, I'll I'll send you. A- <coughs> I'll send you a link to that. Oh, I love that. And I'll show you the secret Masonic handshake on the way out. Oh, that sounds good. Thanks. Mike, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Our final guest is Harold Bloom. Harold simply writes, my answer is Shakespeare to both. And that is the end of the 2016 edition of the guest list on the Virtual Memories Show. I did promise you some of my faves, so here goes. And remember, um, if you want or if you're insane, you can visit ChimeraObscura.com slash VM and check out the list of every book I have finished reading since 1989 when I started college. According to my great spreadsheet that knows all, I read about 45 books this year. It's 44, but I know I'm going to finish two or three more before the end of the year, but whatever. Um, the thing is... I reread a bunch of classics and or favorites, and it would be easy to just say The Leopard, etc. for for my favorite read of the year. But I figure I'm going to save it for books I read for the first time, because otherwise, you know, it's cheating. So in fiction, while I did reread The Leopard uh, by Giuseppe Lampedusa, as cited by Carol Tyler, um, and that pretty much tops every list for me, there was also Anna Karenina, which was my third reading and hit me in very different ways from the last time I read it in 1997. as well as rereads of Solaris, The Good Soldier of Miss Lonely Hearts, among others. Um, we're going to go with new ones. So among first-time reads, there's the book I read on New Year's Day 2016. I read it in one day, I think in one sitting. And that's The Friends of Eddie Coyle by George V. Higgins. 
I'd seen the movie starring Robert Mitchum a couple of years ago, and it's good, but the book is just flat out electric. It is this dialogue driven crime novel about a guy who has to snitch to get out of a federal charge and everybody knows he's going to have to snitch or take the time. And, um, well, the energy in this book is just overwhelming. It's, it's really fantastic. And apparently Higgins never got anywhere that good again, but hell man, you hit it once. That's, that's enough. Another really good book, uh, it's a double first timer. Uh, it's Nitro Mountain, uh, an Appalachian noir novel by a first time author named Lee Clay Johnson. I met Lee in Bennington in 2015 and he sent me a PDF of the book and now it's out in print. Um, it just knocked me the heck out. It's another one you'll find yourself devouring in like one or two sittings, probably two. The book's broken up into two parts. You should read one, give it a rest and then, then jump into the second half. It's a, uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic novel. And actually, there is a weird novel that I also read in one sitting. Uh, that sitting was a plane trip from Newark to Denver in October or November. And I, um, I enjoyed the heck out of that one. Uh, it is Norm MacDonald's Based on a True Story, a memoir. Uh, like Bob Eckstein said earlier, it's not a memoir, although the author uses his, his life and inversions of it to, to build a pretty entertaining novel. I'm, uh, Hoping to get Norm on the show next year to, to talk about books and not comedy. Uh, and I found this a really impressive debut novel. Now, for nonfiction, it was kind of an odd year for me. I didn't read as much nonfiction as I have in past years. And a lot of the nonfiction I read was was memoir. Um, so the most compelling non-memoir nonfiction I read was Arthur Lubau's biography, Deanne Arbus, Portrait of a Photographer. Um, I knew a little about Arbus, and this book was just utterly illuminating. Um, it really placed Arbus's work and, and her impact in context, evoked this really insane life she had, and manages to, to also kind of recreate a lot of the famous photos without just relying on reproduction in the book. He really goes into the settings and is able to describe some of the effects that are in them uh, in, in a really amazing way. So Deanne Arbus, Portrait of a Photographer, probably my favorite nonfiction, although I also loved Cliff Nesteroff's Amazing History of Stand-Up Comedy in America, The Comedians. That one builds on Cliff's years of research and blogging about this history. Uh, that's a, a pretty amazing book too. But again, for me, the, the Arbus book is, is just of a whole. It, it's fantastic. Now, as far as memoirs go, um, it is a toss up between Avid Reader by famed book editor Bob Gottlieb, which Willard Spiegelman mentioned earlier, and The Speed of Sound by Thomas Dolby, which Bob Eckstein also mentioned earlier. Um, Gottlieb captures like a half century of the New York publishing scene uh, or longer um, and reminds us that <sighs> loving good books can actually be the basis of a career, or at least it could be. I don't know now, but Gottlieb shows what, what, how important it is to actually love the books in order to, to build a career in publishing. Now, he also drops a million names, which which I find pretty entertaining, and there's lots of literary gossip and, and kind of score settling, which I enjoy the heck out of. If that's your speed, you should give Avid Reader by Bob Gottlieb a shot. I don't want to talk too much about Thomas Dolby's book, since we just did our interview last week, and it's coming up in January, and I will talk about it more there. Um, but it's a really good memoir about a fascinating life. Uh, the book is split in two parts, covering Dolby's music career up through the early 90s and then his second act as an accidental tech entrepreneur at the opening days of the World Wide Web. Both parts are fascinating, and his his prose is really clear, unadorned, not um, not esoteric like some of the, the, the lyrics of his stuff, uh, of his songs. There's enough pop gossip to, to entertain you, but the Silicon Valley phase of his life kind of mirrors the way technology became its own rock star sector in the modern age, like the way we care about Elon Musk and, and Tim Cook and people like that now. Um, now your mileage may vary. I'm, I'm weird, as you know. Um, but still, I'm a big fan of Dolby's music, and I love to see how outsiders interpret the business world. So this thing was right up my alley, The Speed of Sound by Thomas Dolby. That's from uh, Flatiron Books. 
Now, my honorary mention or the book I want every damn body to buy is Footnotes from the World's Greatest Bookstores by Bob Eckstein. It's sort of a coffee table book, but not, you know, giant coffee table size. Uh, it's got paintings by Bob of 75 wonderful bookstores, past and present, plus anecdotes of each one by writers, artists, or owners, or employees of the stores, or you know, good patrons of the place. Um, it's a beautiful book, and I just found myself grinning from ear to ear as I read it, and I, I took in the stories and the visuals. Uh, I really can't recommend footnotes enough. It would make a great present for any any book-happy people in your life. In fact, I've already ordered a couple of copies from Amazon for gifts for uh, family and friends. So uh, for 2017, I that, that's the last of my 2016s. Um, I can't think of any comics that really knocked me out the way last year had invisible ink and the story of my tits this time around for some reason nothing's coming to mind i'll probably think of it afterwards or some cartoonist will be mad at me that i didn't cite theirs but whatever um but anyway for 2017 don't have a lot of plans um i started reading evil and waugh's sword of honor trilogy a few weeks ago but i, I had to put it down because of podcast related reading um i do hope to get back to that one as soon as i can and I'm also working my way through Sandy McClatchy's Sweet Theft, a poet's commonplace book. Um, that one is, it's filled with, it, it's a commonplace book. So it's, it's quotations and things that he's found in other people's work over the years, as well as notes of his. And it's, um, it's a really beautiful book and it's got really wonderful things. And I just read a page here and there and that's all you need to, to read. But you sort of see all the little things that someone a devoted artist found over the course of his career. Um, we find out what's in the books, you know? Now, last year, I said I would like to get to those Sword of Honor books by Waugh, uh, along with Dan Klaus's book, Patience, The Radetzky March by Joseph Roth, and Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. And the only one I got to was a Klaus book, and it's only a comic, so I did not live up to any of my, my plans, or at least my projections last year. Still, I'm going to roll the dice on those three uh, again for 2017. First and foremost, I'm going to knock out the Sword of Honor books, swear to God. And like Harold Bloom, I really should spend more time reading Shakespeare. Now, early January, I will post my annual write-up, Another Year in the Books, on the Virtual Memories blog, where I go over every book I, I finished over 2016, and that'll be at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. And that is it for this year's guest list. Um, the Virtual Memories Show is something I make almost every week. It's all about keeping literary culture alive. And if you'd like to become a, a supporter of the podcast and help me with that project, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. And once you're there, you can set up a recurring or one-time donation, and that'll get you access to our monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, uh, as well as patron-only blog posts, uh, postcards of past guests. I'm looking at doing a series of ebooks next year and, and more. Um, and all those contributions and donations, they go to helping me defray some of the ongoing costs of making this show, like web hosting, travel, equipment. Um, if you want to help with that, and I'd appreciate it, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make your donation and support the art of fine conversation. A special thanks go out to 2016's donors, especially the above and beyond donors like Paul W. Jones, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate. We've got the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David has a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and support that at Facebook.com slash David and David Music. Next week, for the final show of 2016 because we're taking December 27th off, I plan to have a conversation with Ed Ward, author of the new History of Rock and Roll, Volume 1, 1920 to 1963, from Flatiron Books. I say plan because we're supposed to record on Monday, and we're getting a bunch of snow tonight here in New Jersey, and I'm afraid I won't be able to get into New York tomorrow. Until next time. 
Regardless of that, you can subscribe to the show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter or Instagram at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. It'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs>